Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mondays with Monday. And that's me, Jim Mundy, the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation. And as you can see by the background, we're back in my third floor Garrick Library recording this episode. So today we're going to talk about a league member. And there are many league members of the course of the league's history who have had a, in many different kinds of impacts on Philadelphia, but probably I go to bet no one is more recognizable than the gentleman we're about to learn about. And his name was John Wanamaker. And if you're as old as me, you remember John Wanamaker's. You may not remember him himself personally because after all he died in 1922, but you certainly remember the, the department store on Market and 13th, uh, that iconic building with that iconic signature. So let's get started, shall we? So I'm gonna share my screen to get the show on the road. Okay, and then hit that, and I hit that, and here we go. Oh, dogs, I did it. I thought I was a little rusty. I probably still am. Anyway, this is that famous signature that everybody recognized uh, on that Philadelphia landmark building, the department store. So, and of course, they were in bronze attached to the columns on both Market Street and Chestnut Street. And of course, they were removed when the store was sold in 1978. But if you still go to McGillan's Ale House on Drury Lane, just a block away from the department store, you can find one of those bronze or brass signatures hanging on the wall in McGillan's Ale House. So, so Wanamakers is still with us, I guess is my point. All right, this is the John Wanamaker about whom we're going to talk. You can see he was born in 1838, died in 1922, 84 years old. Um, born in what was then what we today would think of as the Grace Ferry neighborhood, because in 1830, I remember the city of Philadelphia was just that those two square miles from river to river and, and vine to south. The rest was Philadelphia County. So in today's Philadelphia, which was unified in 1854, we would think of this as the Grace Ferry neighborhood. All right. So we're talking on the east side of the Schuylkill, where Grace Ferry was. It was also on the west side at the same time, because they had to go from bank to bank. And that's the neighborhood where he was born and raised. So this is the homestead, the family homestead in Grace Ferry. His father uh, was Nelson, his mother Elizabeth. His father was a brick maker and from a city that was built of brick. And as you can see, the house is the same way. So uh, young John would only have three years of education before he went to work with his father in the family brickyard itself, okay, the, the brick manufacturer. And Wanamaker, uh, would obviously uh, do a whole lot more with his life than just stay with bricks. Uh, and it's an exciting life indeed. But to think that it began in such a humble circumstances as this, in such a humble building at the same time, because when you see where he died and some other his homes, it is just an amazing transformation of an individual and what they could do in the 19th century. So, all right. So young John went to work for his father at the age of 14. And again, as I said, only three years of formal education, not much at all if you think about it. And uh, the family would be relatively successful, although there were some issues with larger brickmakers uh, pushing his father's business out of the way, so to speak. So they briefly went to Indiana, 1850, 1851. And then when John, young John came back, uh, he would still continue to work in his father's brick manufacturing business, but he would also though branch out on his own. He got a job working first in a bookstore of all things, and then he would go to work at a clothing department store, a small one, not a very big one. But then, and this is young John, um, as he would have looked in his early 20s. And at this point, since we're talking 1851, we are talking in his, you know, about that age. This is what he would have looked. And then in 1857, he went to work for John Bennett's clothing bazaar and you can see it here it's at 518 market street long gone of course but apparently it was here that wanamaker really got that entrepreneurial bug if that's the way to put it and that would lead him to becoming the probably the greatest entrepreneur in philadelphia in his lifetime so uh, and even mr bennett himself said that you know after just a few conversations with him wanamaker that he said no this kid's going to go places and he did and this is where he went. Now, in 1859, he married Mary Brown. And uh, that year, or within a year, he and his brother-in-law, 
Nathan Brown opened up their own clothing store called Oak Hall. And it was on the corner of Sixth and Market Streets. And it was here that, young, that John Wanamaker really began his climb into the mercantile world and world of famous fame. Uh, his, this was on their first day of business. Jeez, actually, uh, what did they do? Uh, they, they opened the business up on April the 8th of 1861, just a few days before the Civil War begins. On their first day, they grossed $24.67. 10 years later, by 1871, they're grossing over $2 million a year, which is remarkable. I mean, given the value of money and post world, well, and, and, and post Civil War America, I mean, just absolutely astounding. Uh, his brother-in-law would die and John would open up his own store briefly at the corner uh, on 18, 18, 18, 818 Market Street. And while he was doing all of this and learning the tricks of the trade, he would buy this building in 1875. This is the old Pennsylvania Railroad Freight House. And that's the corner of 13th and Market Streets in Center City, just a block east of City Hall, right? It would take a year, but he would reconfigure the buildings and the space and he would open up what he called the Grand Depot just before uh, the centennial opened on May the 10th of 1876. And this is what he did. Isn't that amazing to take a railroad depot and turn into a building like this? It's wonderfully, uh, it's a wonderful pastiche of different architectural styles, a little Moorish, a little Gothic, a little bit of everything thrown in. Uh, but just, it must have been an amazing building to see, a little an experience. This, then this is what it looks like in a photograph. You can see it's a little toned down, maybe not quite as exuberant as the illustration we just saw before. But nonetheless though, uh, this is the building that really catapulted the Wanamaker department store and John Wanamaker himself. And this is an overall sketch to give you some idea of just how big it was and where it was in Center City. So we're looking at what would be the Southeast corner. That's Chestnut Street to the left and 13th to the right. So we're looking northwest towards City Hall, which wasn't completed as you see it until 1901. So give you some sense of what Center City looked like at that point in time. But nonetheless, um, you can just see how much space it took up and how big it was. And it was a remarkable building. Kind of wish I'd been alive back then to see it. And this is the floor plan, right? Market Street on the left, Chestnut Street on the right. And here we go, because as you can see on the left-hand side, when you walk in, you have men's and boys clothing department and then boot and shoe department. And it was the first time that really retailers, merchants like this, had used the word department to designate different goods that were being sold within the store itself. Hence, this is the beginning of the department store. One of John Wanamaker's many, many firsts, and he had many of them. Over the years, when well, the 15 years between opening Oak Hall and the Grand Depot. Now let's take a look at what it actually looked like. There you go. There's an illustration of what it looked like with people in it. And you can just get the sense of the immensity of it, the scale of it. I mean, that's a whole city block under one large roof. So Wanamaker pioneered many, many things. Probably the most uh, radical at that point in time was he introduced price tags because previously shoppers haggled with the merchants and the owners over the price of their goods. Uh, so now you have a price tag. You know what you're buying. You know what it's going to cost automatically. Wanamaker also pioneered the use of return policy. You could return your, your merchandise and get a full refund. All right. A no-brainer in today's mercantile world, but back then that was quite an accomplishment and quite a radical thing to do. Wanamaker was also the first uh, merchant to uh, actually take up half a full page advertisements in newspapers to promote his store. He was the first one to hire a full-time ad copywriter for those ads themselves. Uh, so you can see that obviously he's marketing, he's, he's got it in his blood and he's gonna make it work for him. Uh, he also was the first one to introduce electric light bulbs in a department store, an elevator in a department store. He was the first one to send his buyers overseas to Western Europe, to like London and Paris and places like that to see what the merchants over in those parts of the world were doing, and then also to buy goods and bring them back to, to the Philadelphia store. So really, uh, he was setting the tone for what the modern mercantile world would become in the 20th century. Pretty neat stuff, all right? And this is what John Wanamaker looked like during this time period, all right? Um, pretty handsome looking guy, isn't he? 
you know, they started out in a brickyard. Uh, and while all this was going on, and again, we're talking 1876 was the opening of the Grand Depot. In 1880, he would join the Union League of Philadelphia, and he would stay a member until he died in 1922. Um, so we'll get a, a little bit more into Watermaker's personal life a little later on, but just wanted you to know that much. All right. And we talked about advertising. And this is a quote from Wanamaker's. Half the money I spent on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. So, but nonetheless, though, advertise he did. And I, I love this illustration. Uh, you know, a catalog, you know, a hard copy paper catalog, something that obviously is is being lost in the 21st century because of the electronic world we live in. But nonetheless, it's a really wonderful window into the past, isn't it? And here we have on the left hand side, as you can see, latest Paris novelties, always first at the Wanamaker stores, Philadelphia, Paris, and New York, right? Because in 1896, Wanamaker did a few things. He bought out the New York City Mercantile House called Alexander Stewart and built his own store in New York City. He also opened up stores in Paris and London that year. So now it's becoming an empire in its own way, a mercantile empire. And I threw the one in on the right-hand side because I liked it, because that's the way I remember Wanamaker's from my being a kid in the 1950s and the 1960s. But again, it goes to reinforce that whole image of marketing. So if people don't know what you're selling, they're not going to buy it, right? And that was the genius of Wanamaker in a lot of different ways during all this time period. All right. And then, all right, the next big step. And this is the one that we all think of as Wanamaker's in Philadelphia, right? Um, 1910, he takes the Grand Depot and is going to turn it into the largest retail building in the world. He hires the Chicago architectural firm of Daniel Burnham. Uh, and remember Burnham, who prophesied that, you know, don't think small, think big. And Burnham could do it. And so this is the, the building that Daniel Burnham and company designed. Now, to show you the genius of Wanamaker, he never shut down the Grand Depot. What they did was they tore it down in third sections. And once one third went down, then Burnham would build that third. They would take down the next third and up goes the second part of the building. And then likewise with the third. So during the two years, if you will, the year and a half to two years that this building was under construction, they never closed for business. Now, how's that for being a smart guy? All right, and pretty smart it is. So this building had over 2 million square feet of retail space. It's 12 stories, nine of which were used for the department store itself. And, uh, and so who would have thought that, you know, but, and we never do think, but Philadelphia has really, really got some neat buildings and some wonderful stories, mercantile, uh, just manufacturing stories, industrial stories, mercantile stories to talk about the biggest and the best, if you will. And that's what Wanamaker's turned out to be. And this is a photograph of his office. All right. Now, uh, I haven't thought about this in ages, but um, after he died, and after at one point, they kept the office intact in the department store. And after it was sold in 1978, um, 76 or 78, uh, the office was given intact to the Starkville Study of Pennsylvania. I feel, so, little HSP. And this is Wanamaker sitting at his desk. They're perhaps not the most organized desk we've ever seen in the world, but still you get the idea that Wanamaker, you know, busy, didn't he? All right, now a few other things about Wanamaker. In 1850, and he was a very religious man, uh, raised in the Presbyterian faith. And so in 1859, he created the Bethany Sunday School at 21st and South, 20th and South, shall we say. Uh, wasn't very popular in that neighborhood. Actually, twice neighbors basically mobbed uh, the building and forced the people to flee and shut it down, resorted to being a tent. Uh, and then the fire department actually was called out to protect the occupants of the building, the, the people attending Sunday school. But then finally in October of that year, he laid the ground or the, the, the cornerstone for what became Bethany Church. And this is what it looked like. It was on South Street between 21st and 22nd Street. And it would become the largest Sunday school operation in America. And not surprising, is it? Because everything he did, he did big. And along those lines, in terms of his Christian values, uh, when he came back from uh, Minnesota, which I mentioned earlier, 
The first job he got was as the first secretary for the Philadelphia branch of the YMCA, paid a thousand bucks a year. And within the first year, he went from 40, 57 members to over 2000 members. So you can see, obviously he, he, he knew how to market and he knew how to proselytize, if you will, and he knew how to sell. And that's how successful he was. And you know, in all of his life and everything he did. The only time perhaps he wasn't quite as successful as he could have been was maybe as the US postmaster because um, he, he was a Republican politically and he supported Benjamin Harrison in the 1880 election, gave him $10,000. And Harrison in turn named him the postmaster general. And it was at that point that, uh, you know, this being the age of the spoil system, uh, Wanamaker immediately fired all the Democrats that he had inherited from Grover Cleveland's administration before him and replace the Republicans belt. You can imagine <laughs> when you get rid of 3,000 people, that's gonna cause some political waves and it did. But nonetheless though, once they got it figured out, uh, the ship evened on the keel and went say, and there was some smooth sailing after that. Uh, for instance, Wanamaker was the, he introduced commemorative stamps to the Postal Service. He created the rural free delivery system, uh, creating over 5,000 uh, delivery routes in rural America as it was in the 1890s. Remember, um, there were still some territories at that point in time. It wasn't a complete, you know, 50 United States yet. Uh, he, oh, what else did he do? Oh, he introduced the pneumatic tube system in the, in the uh, post office service building. If you've ever seen it in Washington, it's a big building and you can understand how important that was. Uh, he also missed the mark in one way in the sense that he predicted that um, mail would continue to be delivered by horse and carriage and buggy for the next 100 years. And clearly that, <laughs> that didn't pan out, did it? Though? But nonetheless though, but you get some idea of just the way his mind worked, um, but also the way he worked off of his personal uh, convictions and things like that, especially with his, uh, with his religious convictions. So when was it? Um, 1898 or thereabouts, Wanamaker with uh, two fellow industrialists, if you will, uh, John B. Stetson, the hat maker, and W. Atley Burpee, the seed manufacturer, created something called the Sunday Breakfast Mission School. Uh, and that still exists to this day. And the idea was just to simply feed hungry people on Sunday mornings. And that is still going strong to this very day. So obviously Wanamaker relied on his religion and his, and his Christianity to be charitable towards fellow citizens. Now, when he died, in 1922, he would be buried initially in the churchyard next to the Bethany church itself. So but let's get on. All right. We talked about some homes that he owned once upon a time. Well, this is his suburban villa called Lindenhurst in Jenkintown, north of the city. And he lived here from 1883 to 1907 when the house burned down and was replaced by a different house later on. So obviously part of that, um, Boy, and the Jenkintown, uh, Elkins Park area was the home of some of the wealthiest Philadelphians um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It's not surprising he was there. This was his center city residence at 2032 Walnut Street. A little darker on the left, uh, an, an early photograph of it. And then on the right hand side, a photograph that was taken uh, when the building, uh, an historic American building survey was made of the building late in the 20th century. And the building eventually, unfortunately, burned down and the facade was saved. And behind it, there is now the Wanamaker condominium building. But nonetheless, it was in this house that Wanamaker died on December the 12th of 1922 at age, as I said earlier, 84 years old. All right. Now, when he died, geez, let's see. He was a multi, 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 multi-millionaire. His estate was valued at over $100 million. Uh, which he left to his four surviving children. And of course he left the company, the, the Wanamaker's department store in a trust that was then handed over to his son, Rodman Wanamaker. And we'll talk about him maybe in a further episode. So he was quite a Philadelphian in his own way. All right. And this is where Wanamaker was reinterred. Um, Rodman became an Episcopalian and uh, they were members of um, St. Mark's on 16th street which is where Rodman's wife is buried. But this is the family plot at St. James the Less, uh, basically just behind Laurel Hill Cemetery in the East Falls neighborhood of Philadelphia. And that is a bell tower, just so you know. And the, the family vaults on the left and right hand side inside the chapel itself. 
And I would suggest you go there sometime. It's really a magnificent cemetery, relatively small, beautiful church, lots of league members buried there. And this is the most outstanding of all of the buildings on the site. Um, here we have it. The last slide in the show, but boy, what a better one to end with than a statue that was erected to John Wanamaker shortly after he died. Now at his funeral, his funeral was attended by over 15, thousand Philadelphians. It was probably the largest one since the Civil War period after um, Lincoln and, and Octavius Cato. 15,000 people went past the beer at, uh, at Bethany Church. And after his death, over 400,000 Philadelphians contributed over $35,000 to have this sculpture erected in Wanamaker's honor. And if you walk on the East Apron of City Hall, on the Northeast corner of the apron, uh, looking to the southeast you will see the department store at 13th and filbert and what greater tribute could there be to one of philadelphia's great 19th and 20th century citizens so and a union league member so so that's the end of our story uh i didn't go as you can tell deep in the weeds on the building itself that could be done sometimes in the future i mean talk about the grand court with the organ the eagle, you know, meet me at the eagle, and those great Philadelphia phrases and things like that. There's so much more we could have said, but that would take days, <laughs> and you and I don't have them, uh, and I'd get in trouble if I did that. So I'm going to end this episode right here and say thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something more about the famous Philadelphian and Union League member that we didn't know much about before. So, so stay tuned. We'll do some more stuff, uh, fun stuff in the future. So, but in the meantime, everybody, stay safe, stay well, and see you later. Thanks for watching. Bye.